Well, hey, my name is Josh, and I'm one of the pastors here. And last week we started a series that we're going to do for four weeks called Set Free to Live Free, uh, starting in Romans chapter 6 and just taking the big themes of the Romans 6, 7, and 8. Uh, and as we were preparing for this series, uh, we were on, we traveled to California on, uh, on last week, and uh, there was... There was a flight from Pullman to Seattle, and there was a really quick layover, and so the flight was really early, and I didn't get coffee, and then we were going from Seattle to uh, Oakland, California, and I was like, okay, I'm on the flight. I'm going to get some coffee, so uh, I I had some time, and I thought, I'm going to read, because in prep for this series, I want to read Romans 1 through 8, like in one setting, Uh, and then I started getting sleepy, and so then I got airplane coffee, which isn't great, but whatever, right? And so drinking airplane coffee, reading Romans 1 through 8, trying to get my head around this. Uh, and honestly, when you read Romans 1 through 6, like there's, there's a sense that this is almost like a lawyer laying out a case to, to this group of people that live in Rome, trying to tell them the bad news about their lives and how bad it is and how broken it is and how terrible it is. And then slowly, like w- chapter 1 and 2 is just hard and heavy. And then 3 kind of turns and gets a little bit better. But then something happens in chapter 6 where like, I know I'm on an airplane and maybe it was the coffee that was just like making me feel good about the world. But something happens in chapter 6 where all that was pressing down on you in 1 through 5 starts to be pulled off of you in 6. And you're like, whoa, that's great news in light of everything you just told me that was terrible in the whole world. And and you start to see something happen in Romans chapter 6 that crescendos in Romans chapter 8 and then finishes really beautifully for the rest of the book. Uh, But but the picture is, is this word freedom, that there were some things we were enslaved to and then it turns and those things were holding us down, beating us down. We were broken and dead in those things. And then it turns and that gets lifted off of us. And this picture of freedom, I think everyone in this room, we're drawn to that because we know if we're honest, we, there's things that we're not free from that we want to be free from. And, and so uh, that, that's the narrative you find in the book of Romans. And uh, if you've been around Resonate for very long, you may have heard us tell this story. And I still don't know if it's a true story, but I'm going to tell it to you again because I found it on the internet. And... Stuff on the internet's worth sharing. Uh, but there's an old story of, of Abraham Lincoln in the 1860s that he, in somewhat of a disguise, went down to a slave auction and he starts bidding for a little girl that, that's being auctioned. Um, and, and the story goes that this little girl sees, you know, who is Abraham Lincoln bidding on her and he keeps going higher and higher and she thinks to herself, this is just another Uh, white man who's going to buy me and likely abuse me uh, and be harsh to me. And so she she's kind of going that route. And Abe Lincoln keeps going higher and higher. And ultimately he wins and he's the highest bidder for this little girl. And as they're walking away, Abe and this little girl, he he stops and he kneels down and he looks at her and he says, "Uh, young lady, uh, you, you are now free. I've paid the price for you. You're now free. And she said, what is what does it mean that I'm free? And he said, it means that you're free. And she says, well, what, is, what does it mean? Does it mean I can say whatever I want to say? And Lincoln said, yeah, you, you can say whatever you want to say. And then she said, does it mean I can be whatever I want to be? And Lincoln says, yeah, dear, you can be whatever you want to be. That's what freedom means. Uh, and then she said, does it mean I can go wherever I want to go? And Lincoln says, of course, you're free. You can go wherever you want to go. And then this little girl with tears streaming down her face says, if, if that's true, I can go wherever I want to go. Then I want to go with you because you're the one that paid the price for my freedom. And if that's the kind of person you are, then I want to be with you. And so again, that story has been told, and I don't know if that's true of Abraham Lincoln, um, but I know it's absolutely true of Jesus, that there's something that happens in us when you become a Christian, there's been a payment made for your slavery and your sin and your death and what's being beat up about you. There's been a payment made And what happens is is a loyalty is produced in you to where you look at Christ and say, where you go, I go. What you say, I say. What you care about, I care about. There's been something that's happened there. And the biblical picture is that we were taken out of Adam. Think Adam and Eve, first people to sin. Taken out of Adam and now put in Christ. And so what's happening in Romans chapter 6 is Paul is trying to teach us what was true of Adam, sin, used to be true of you, sinner, But now what Jesus has done is now what's true of Jesus, not sinner, is now true of you, no longer a sinner. And so that's the case that's being laid out because you were born into 
sin into Adam and now you've been transferred into Christ. And so uh, if you don't believe you were born to be a sin, or born as a sinner, uh, we'd like you to volunteer for Resonate Kids next week. And then you can see that you are, in fact, uh, dealing with people who are natural born sinners. Their parents did not teach them to bite, to kick each other, to hurt each other, yet they bite, kick each other, and hurt each other. I have never stolen something from my wife, yelled mine, and ran into the other room and slammed the door. Uh, yet my kids do that daily. So there's, a, there's something that happens in us from birth that needs to be fundamentally changed. Fundamentally changed. And here's what the Bible is teaching. The Bible is teaching that when we became a Christian, not only did your relationship to God change, your relationship to sin changed. That's what the scripture is teaching. Not only did your relationship to God change, that now he's your father. And now Jesus has paid it all for you. But now your relationship to sin has changed as well. You are free from sin. Did you know that? That's great news today. You're free from sin. Sin no longer has mastery over you. You should live like you're free from sin because you are free from sin. That's, that's just categorically true. But let's be honest. I think some of you are like, uh, hey, Josh, real quick. Like uh, this, this question isn't about me. It's like I have a friend that I know that'd like to know. Um, totally, we're free from sin. That's great. But like, why do I not feel free from sin? Like my friend wants to know this. <laughs> like not me. I, I don't struggle with that because I'm at church and I don't ever tell you my struggles but I have this friend who's really bound up and so many of us like if we're honest we we believe that we're free from sin but listen we are functionally and practically still slaves to our old ways of life and so if I'm a Christian why do I struggle is the question so in Romans chapter 7 uh, I think we're going to see how this plays out and how this helps us and how this affects us so if I'm a Christian why do I still struggle uh, is, is somewhat answered in Romans chapter 7. So if you have your Bible, starting in verse 14, we're going to read through this and get us to a place where this makes sense for us. So in Romans chapter 7, verse 14, why do I struggle with sin if I am really set free? It says this, We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual. Sold as a slave to sin. That's, we already covered that. We've been slave to sin. Jesus has bought us back. Verse 15, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And you're like, that's a good memory verse for all of us, right? You're like, hey, could you describe your Christian life? Yeah, I do stuff I hate all the time. You're like, Romans 7, 15, tattoo that on your arm. <laughs> and if I do what I don't want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it's no longer myself who do it, but it's the sin living in me. You're like... I can't figure this thing out. It's like there's something else living in me. Verse 18, for I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. I want to go to the gym, but I can't go. I want to not eat 14 cookies when my kids stress me out, but I can't do it. I eat 15. That's just me. One time I ate a whole sleeve of Thin Mints. A sleeve. There's only two sleeves in a box. <laughs> Your boy put down a sleeve while watching Netflix. 800 calories. <laughs> to my shame. Where was I? Verse 19. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin living in me that does it. Verse 22. So I find this law at work in me. Now, I know that was confusing, but stay with me. I find this law at work in me. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. And th verse 22 is like so beautiful. In, for in my inner being, I delight in God's law. It's like, dude, I, I'm like in. Like, I love Christ. I want to honor Christ. I, I'm in the word. In my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin that is working within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? What a wretched man I am, Paul says. Who, and he even blames his body. Who's going to rescue me from this body that my mouth speaks crazy stuff? My hands do the wrong things. My body does the wrong thing. Who's going to rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Christ Jesus our Lord. So this is the Apostle Paul, real quick. Brother wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, 
spent most of his Christian life in jail for the sake of the gospel with chains on his wrist, writing the Bible. That's who wrote this. And he pioneered and he planted churches when he became a follower of Jesus. Before he was a Christian, he murdered Christians. He was a Pharisee and he, he's on his way to murder more Christians when Jesus confronts him and post-resurrected Jesus shows up to him and blinds him and converts him and tells him, now you're gonna be the guy that goes out and suffers for my name. This is a pioneer, a leader. This guy is like self-appointed apostle. Jesus calls him an apostle and he goes for it. And he is the one who is struggling. He's also the guy in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, who says, follow me as I follow Christ. You know how your parents say like, do what I say, don't do what I do. You ever heard your parents say that? They're like, don't follow my example, but listen to my, like obey my words. Paul's like, no, 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 do what I do. There's another passage where he says, imitate me. Imitate my way of life, follow my way of life. Philippians verse three, he's like, I consider everything compared to Christ as a loss compared to knowing Jesus. Like he is the guy who there's certain times where you think he's like on the mountaintop, you know, cross-legged with his hands out, just like meeting with God on like an appointment that only God talks to Paul in these moments. But then there's this sense of struggle he has. He is struggling. Uh, I, I remember watching Michael Jordan miss a dunk. And I was like, well, that's helpful. Like now people miss dunks. And you're like, Michael Jordan misses dunks. LeBron misses dunks. Like there, there's a sense of which there's a humanity to them that is helpful. And so we, we have to get this, that, that Paul is struggling to show us something. And, and it's this. You were saved to struggle. You were not saved from struggle. You were saved to struggle. In other words, you used to be dead and you couldn't even struggle. The, the Bible calls us dead. We couldn't even fight back, but now we can fight back. Like you want to know where no one sins? Um, all of the people that are currently in a graveyard don't sin. Why? Because they're dead. Dead people don't sin. And, and so you used to be unable to fight back because we were dead. And now you're saved into a way where you can struggle. Sin has been dethroned, but the power of sin in my life is now fighting with me and I can fight back. And so the Christian life is not a deliverance from all the struggle. It's, it's a group of, of weapons and, and theological truth that sends you into the struggle, able to do something about it. You can fight. The power has been taken away. Uh, my, my Bible professor in college would teach Romans chapter six this way. Uh, he said he bought, him his family bought a TV from Sears. Do you guys even remember what Sears is? Like some of you are like, oh, Josh, I have a Sears card in my pocket. Some of you are like, how do you spell Sears, right? So there's this place called Sears. They used to sell televisions. And Dr. Bob bought a TV from Sears and it wasn't working after a period of time. And so he had to like look up the number and call the repairman for Sears. And the repairman comes in. He's like, I don't know, it was working the other day, but now it's not working anymore. I don't know what's going on. Um, and the repairman does some checks and then uh, walks around to the back of the TV. And to uh, Dr. Bob's shame, the repairman plugs in the television. There's nothing more shameful in a man's life <laughs> than this moment of a repairman coming in and plugging in your television and then turning it on and saying, give me $100 for fixing your TV, whatever, right? So to his shame, his TV wasn't plugged in. There was no power. And so Dr. Bob goes on to talk about what, what happened in the gospel is that, that Jesus unplugged the television. So there's a sense where the power source has been cut off now. And when you and I sin, you gotta catch this, when you and I sin, we get off the couch, walk to the television, scoot it out a bit, plug it in, put it back in place, and then we sin. There is a sense by which we don't have to. That, that, that's important. That there's a sense by which the, the power has been cut off. And every time we go, we plug it back in. You're like, Josh, why is this important? It's important because we have to take mutual responsibility for our Christian walk. We have to understand that Jesus did something for us. He did all of the work for us. This is important. That then allowed us to join him in the work. So you, if you get this wrong, you, you get a different gospel. So many people in the world think, I've got to plug in my own TV. I've got to figure this thing out. I've got to do works and then God will be pleased with me. No, 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 you don't. You've got to trust that Jesus did all of it for you. That you were dead. 
You, you, you couldn't do anything. He did it all for you. And then when you say, okay, I trust that, what happens is you are raised to life so that now you can join in the work. The, the, the fancy word is Jesus did your justification and invites you to join him in sanctification, becoming like him, taking responsibility to be like him. So th- this is probably the hardest part of the sermon is that you and I have to agree and have to believe that it is our responsibility. It is, it's oftentimes our joy, sadly, to go and plug in the TV of sin and say, hey, enemy, I know that Jesus has unplugged it and you no longer have power over me, but the truth is I love my sin and I want to continue in that sin. And so many of us feel powerless against sin and so beat up over sin, not because Jesus didn't do enough, but because we love to sin. We love it. And we're sold into it and we're bought into it and there's habits that are ingrained in us. And we've done it for so long, it's impossible not to gossip. It's impossible not to be harsh. It's impossible not to think those thoughts. It feels like there's no power for us. But Romans chapter seven is saying the struggle is part of salvation. It's part of the story. So so listen, we have to get this. This is, you could read Romans seven and go, "Why, why, why is that there? What's going on? It's because a true convert may be very weak but they will still be marked by a struggle against sin, brokenness over sin, and confession of sin. A true convert may be very weak, but they are still marked by a struggle against sin. I don't want to do it. I'm going to fight against it. A brokenness. Oh, I plugged in the TV again. I did the thing again. A brokenness over sin and a confession to those around them. Oh, I lost. I got beat up. I, I did the thing I didn't want to do. I ate a sleeve of thin mints. What, like you, you're confessing, you're broken, you're, you're fighting against that. But this is huge. A false convert may profess faith in Christ, but they will be able to live in a state of worldly sin without any affliction in their conscience, without any brokenness of sin in their life, and without any desire to confess that sin or change their behavior. Did you catch that? The mark of a true Christian is the struggle. The mark of a false Christian is no struggle. That's what Romans 7 is about. That I don't want to do this, but I do it. In my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I can't figure this out. That is the Christian life. That's the definition of victory. So many preachers, so many things you go to are preaching victory over you. You can be free from that stuff. You can be financially free. You can be physically free. Victory, victory, victory. When the Bible talks about victory, it's what Jesus did for you. That's victory. What it talks about in our life is the struggle, the fight, the balance of constantly going back and forth. Because if you start to believe victory is all the time, every time, then if you fail one time, you don't know if you're a Christian anymore. I love AA where they're like, hey, uh, I haven't had a drink in 21 years, but I still probably am an alcoholic. So I'm not going to go to bed tonight with a, with a glass of scotch next to my pillow. You guys cool with that? <laughs> There's a sense of knowing I'm walking in victory, but I'm still in a struggle. That's huge for us. I'm walking in victory, but I'm still in a struggle. Because the spiritual life that we're in, the spiritual life it, is a movement with two parts. It's a movement towards something and a movement away from something. It's a movement towards something and a movement away from something. Th- think uh, the- theologians would call this mortification. I want to die to some stuff. I want to kill some stuff. I'm mortified by some stuff. And then they would call this vivification. I want some stuff to flourish. I want some stuff to come to life. Think viv- like life. I want life and I want death. Mortification, vivification. If you were to use gardening terms, there's some weeds that I want to kill. There's some stuff that's got to get out of here. And there's some flowers I want to plant. There's some things that I want to flourish. There's some stuff that I'm going to water. If you were to think pulling of weeds and planting of flowers, this is the picture. And this struggle plays out in members of our body. It plays out in our mouth. It plays out in our eyes. It plays out in our hands. There's some stuff that we do with our hands that we need to kill and some things we need to take on. There's some things we see with our eyes that we need to kill and there's some other things we need to look at. There's some things we speak with our mouth that we need to mortify and there's some things that we speak with our mouth that we need to vivify. We need to see those things flourish. That's where the struggle plays out in our bodies. And the progression of this is is temptation-based progression. You're tempted by things and then you move one way or the other based on those temptations. So in James chapter one, there's a really helpful picture of how the struggle actually works in day-to-day life. So you go, okay, Josh, I'm struggling. 
true. We're all struggling. How do I get out of this struggle? How do I fight back? You don't have to tell me about feeling shame. I feel a lot of shame, feel a lot of brokenness, but how do I actually get out of this stuff? And in Romans chapter seven, the struggle is real. And in James chapter one, you see a progression of how to fight back against the struggle. And and here in verse uh, 13 of chapter one, it says this. When someone is tempted, they shouldn't say God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when, catch this, when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and they're enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin and sin when it's full grown gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift comes from above, coming from the father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we may be the kind of first fruits of all he created. So there's a progression here. Here's here's how the struggle works. You ready for the process? The process in James 1. In your struggle with sin, here's the process. Number one, the enemy solicits your thoughts. He solicits thoughts to your mind. Number two, your mind consults your affections. Number three, your affections enact your will. In your struggle with sin, here's the process. Every single time, the enemy is going to solicit a thought to your mind. And then in your mind, you're going to kick that thought around a bit and it's likely going to move your affection. You're going to feel something about that. And then you're going to have your head and your heart involved. And then your body parts are going to get involved. And so, for instance, uh, if you're a single girl, you wake up one day and the enemy tells you, you're single. He solicited a thought to your mind and you say, true, uh, I'm not currently dating anyone or engaged or married or whatever. Uh, yeah, that's true. I'm single. And then uh, later that day, your friends want to watch a romantic comedy. And then that thought gets pulled into your emotions and your affections are now stirred and you start to think things you shouldn't have thought because you have a thought that was not a bad thought particularly, but was led to be a bad thought, which leads to your affections that are moved the wrong way, which leads you to dating a loser who you should have never dated, who never deserved your time, who has no desire for the things of God or the kingdom of God, or would be the kind of husband that you want to marry. But you had a thought that solicited your affections that moved your will. You go, how did that happen? Well, you were told something and you were lured. This is fishing terminology. You were lured like the enemy was like, he likes this kind of fish or she likes this kind of bait and throws out the bait. And some of you are like, oh, I can't. Like, have you ever gone fishing with worms? And you're like, oh, I would never eat a worm. That's so gross. And the enemy's like, I know you don't like worms. You like these shiny ones. And you're like, that's true. I do like shiny things. OK. And so then you're solicited in your mind to think um, that guy's TV is bigger than yours. You're like, that is true. He has 65 inches and mine's only 58 inches. That's true. Then you're at Costco and you're like 72 inches. And then your affections are stirred. And then you're calling your friend who has a truck because they've got to come to Costco and pick up a 72 inch TV. And you're like, is that sinful? I don't know. You have to talk that out with your family and your budget and your life. I'm just telling you the process against sin. The struggle is like that. You get a thought solicited to your mind, likely a comparison kind of thought, that then starts to affect your affections, which leads to your will being moved. So that means some of the best knowledge you and I can have in the struggle is self-knowledge on how the enemy gets you. You and I need self-knowledge. How does the enemy get you? What are his baits? What are his lures? What does he put you into? And oftentimes it is not bad things. Uh, I'll, I'll be talking to guys that come in and they're like, me and my girlfriend, like we go too far sexually and I'm just beat up about it. And I can't f- figure out, oh, Romans chapter seven, the struggle is real. And I'm like, well, tell me about it. And he's like, well, there's, you know, like movie night. Like, well, she'll say we want to go watch a movie and then, you know, like we end up watching a movie and then the lights are out and then we're under the blanket and we're watching The Notebook and, you know, the next thing you know, like we're making out and, and you know, it goes too far or whatever. And I'm like, okay, so um, you're watching a movie with the lights out, with blankets on you, with candles lit and The Notebook on. That's not a helpful environment for flourishing of godly things. 
So next time she says movie night and the thought is triggered in your mind, movie night, your affections will be stirred. The smell of candle, the warmth of blankets and the feelings of the notebook are going to come at you. And the next thing you know, you will be doing something you don't want to do. You will be acting in a way you don't want to act. So you're going to say movies aren't evil. Apartments aren't evil. Blankets aren't evil. Candles that smell like vanilla aren't evil. But if all those get together, I'm going to be evil. So instead of that, how about we go to a coffee shop in the public where I'm less likely to grope you? Cool? Tell your girlfriend that next time, guys. I'm less likely to do these things if all those aren't present. And she could say, oh, that's, that's helpful. And you go, well, what is that about? You had something solicited to your mind that stirred your affection that acted on your will. And so is the struggle real? Absolutely the struggle's real. Is the battle ongoing? Absolutely the battle's ongoing. Is the enemy coming at you with all kinds of lures? Absolutely. And you go, here's the brilliant thing. Uh, You know everything the enemy knows. And so oftentimes in our struggle against sin, some of us in this place would get freed up by simply eliminating the moment. As simple as that is. If you looked at your life and, and the sin patterns you have, And you walked it all the way back to the moment where it starts. And you said to yourself, I'm going to eliminate this moment because I know where that leads. Then the enemy would have a very frustrating time tempting you and beating you up and keeping you enslaved to sin because you have been curious about your sin life. So many of us reject our sin life. We don't want to think about our sin life. We're like, oh, this is bad habits. No, no. Investigate your sin. Get curious about your sin. Why do I drink too much? Let's, let's think about that. Get your friends over. Hey guys, we have a work study problem called I drink too much. And I don't want to. And Romans chapter seven, verse 15 is real, man. I delight in God's law, but I drink and I, or what, I, I do this too much or I gossip too much or we go too far sexually or I look at things I shouldn't on the internet. Whatever that thing is, stop being ashamed and hiding it and bring it out to the light and investigate it. And go, what is going on in this area? And try to pull it back all the way to its fountainhead. When does this thing begin? And try to eliminate that moment. You go, Josh, that sounds scary, man. Like, do I really want to do that? Do I want to pull out all my stuff and invest? You're telling me to get curious about my sin? That feels weird. I'm telling you living in a pool of constant sin is a lifeless experience. Living in a pool of constant sin is a lifeless experience. And Jesus has paid a high price for you to be free from that stuff. So pull it out in the light, eliminate the moment, investigate your sin, do what you need to do to figure that out. And I think what will happen for many of us is that we will realize the fountainhead of so many of our struggles are a lie about God. So many of our struggles are something we don't believe God can do. You go, I I gossip because I want to tear other people down. And if you pull that all the way back, you're like, actually, you don't believe that God cares about those people. You don't believe that God is going to do things in your life, even if you don't tear them down. And somehow you have this comparison thing going on in your world where a lie about God leads you to gossip. Or you don't believe God satisfies, so a lie about God leads you to sexual sin. Or you don't believe that the community that God's provided in the church <clears throat> is good enough for you. So you go out and you drink and you party and you find uh, these shallow relationships because you don't think God can take care of that. Or you put stuff on credit cards and you live in ways that aren't healthy for you that are going to lead to a really difficult struggle in your life because you don't believe God provides. And you're not, you're not believing that being content with God what he's given you right now is good enough because all the other people in your life are going to judge you because your TV's not big enough or your stuff's not good enough or, or whatever. And that's a lie about God or you're going the other way and you have more money than some people and you're flaunting that money because you don't believe that, that God has, has asked you to be humble. So at the fountainhead of so many of our sins are a lie about God. A lie about God. And if you can investigate your sin and get curious about your sin and get interested in the struggle, you can possibly find that there's something going on at the fountainhead that if you eliminate the moment or if you figure out that lie, then the enemy is going to have a lot harder time keeping you in the lifeless state of sin. That's what freedom looks like, a curiosity, a diving in. And oftentimes the best defense against sin is a great offense 
Oftentimes the best defense is a great offense. So you, you, uh, the Puritans would say this, when, how do you dislodge a beautiful thing from your heart? And many of the things we sin, many of the things we struggle with are beautiful things in our mind and our heart. Beautiful things. How do you dislodge a beautiful thing? The Puritans would say, you replace it with a more beautiful thing. How do you dislodge a beautiful thing? I replace it with a more beautiful thing. How do I turn off the power of sin in my life? I replace it by looking to the power of God in my life. How do I replace the power of gossip in my life? I replace it with the power of encouragement in my life, speaking life over people. How do I replace the sexual sin I struggle with in my life? I replace it with understanding the design and the purity that God's given us in, in, in sexuality. And, and so there's this exchange that happens. And so uh, the, the first century theologian, Augustine, um, if you've ever read his confessions, I always joke like before Usher had confessions, like Augustine had confessions. You aren't, no, no Usher fans? Okay. Uh, bad joke. Can you remove that from the video? No? Uh, cool. All right. Don't tell the Usher joke ever again. Cool. Um, Augustine wrote a book called Confessions and he struggled with sexual addiction. And he's a first century theologian that God used in mighty ways and struggled with going to brothels going to uh, towns and visiting brothels. And there was a particular place where uh, he had a particular woman who, you know, they had a long-term relationship and a rhythm that he walked in in his sexual addiction. And, and when he has a radical conversion in his life, uh, Augustine was still struggling with this sexual addiction that he, he had. And so he goes and he's starting to preach the gospel in these towns that he used to go to and visit the brothels. And in one story, he goes to a town to, preach the gospel, uh, and this woman who he's had a long-term relationship with comes out, and she's trying to get his attention, and he's not, he's trying to play it off, and uh, she ultimately says, Augustine, it's, it's I, it is I, it is I, and Augustine looks back and says, yeah, but it's, it's not I, it's not I, it's not I, and there's a sense of that identity being shifted, that this was a beautiful thing, and it had to be replaced by a more beautiful thing, and so here's what he writes in the Confessions. He says, how sweet it was all at once to be rid of those fruitless joys, which I once so feared to lose. How sweet it is all at once to be rid of those fruitless joys that I once so feared to lose. You drove them from me, you who are the true sovereign joy. You drove them from me and you took their place, you who are sweeter than all pleasures. You took them from me and you drove them away. You took their place, you who are sweeter than all pleasures pleasures. If you have a beautiful thing you are struggling with, you have to replace it with a more beautiful thing. And the only thing more beautiful, according to the book of James, is looking to your heavenly father, the father of lights. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. Who can save me from this state, this wretched man that I am? Praise be to God who has set us free in Jesus Christ, our Lord. There is an exchange that has already happened that needs to be daily practiced in our life over and over and over again. But some of us don't believe God's a good father. And so that lie that, that we walk in is, is crushing us. That lie that we believe that he's not good, he doesn't take care of us. Uh, I have three daughters, and if you were to say, hey, here's, the, here's the most terrible thing you could ever do to me. You, you could, if you can convince my daughters that I am not for them, I do not love them, and I do not make decisions based on their good. If you could get my daughters to believe that I hate them, that when decisions are made, it's because I'm mean to them, and I'm rude to them, and I'm not loving to them. That is the worst thing you could ever do to a father. And that is the thing the devil does to us every day towards our heavenly father. He doesn't love you. He doesn't have good for you. He's holding out on you. He doesn't want the best for you. He's not the one that gives good and perfect gifts from above. He's the one that gives wrath and, uh, you know, the, the opposite of victory, the slavery you're walking in. That's all from God. And the scripture comes along and says, God's not tempting you. God's not the one hurting you. This is what God offers. Good and perfect things come from above. But you have to walk in that new identity. You have to walk in that new identity. And that is not easy. And so really practically, the things we've got to do is, is we've got to start talking to sin like it's our enemy. And when sin starts to come up, we have to look at it and say, you cannot sin. You cannot borrow my mouth to speak that way. You cannot borrow my legs to move in that direction. You cannot borrow my hands to live that way. We've got to talk to sin like it is our enemy. 
And you've got to tell it, you're not me. I've been exchanged. There's been something that's changed in me. I'm not going to act that way. You talk to sin like it's your enemy. And then right now, this, this is really practical, but right now, pick a member of your body and dedicate it to God as an instrument of righteousness. You go, Lord, I'm going to give you my mouth. The way I've been talking has been a struggle. And Lord, I'm going to give you my mouth. It has been living in sin for years. I've struggled with the way I talk. I've struggled with the way I communicate. I've got to give you my mouth. I'm no longer going to speak harshly to people. I'm no longer going to put people down with my words. I'm no longer going to be a cri critic of everything. God, I'm going to speak encouragement over people. God, I give you my mind. I'm no longer going to think these thoughts of others. I'm no longer going to live this way in my mind. God, I give you my ears. Got to give you my hands. I, I, I'm going to pick a member of my body and dedicate it to you. And I'm going to take action to fight back. And then we've got to be the kind of people that overdose on things that stir our affection for Christ and remind us of our identity in him. Overdose on these kind of things. Figure out a way to fight back. Get curious about your sin. Investigate your sin. And respond by overdosing on things that stir your affection for Christ. If getting up early and drinking coffee and reading the Bible stir your affection for Christ, then tomorrow and as long as you can sustain it, get up early, drink coffee, and read your Bible. If going on runs and listening to Christian music stir your affection for Christ, this afternoon, go on a run and listen to music and stir your affection for Christ. If getting out in nature and praying stir your affection, then put on all the clothes you have because it's freezing outside and get out in nature and talk to God. Overload on things that stir your affection for Christ because the enemy is putting bait on the lure to keep you in a life struggling with sin. And I want to say it again, a life of staying in sin is a lifeless experience. Fight back. Walk in your new identity. I tell you stories about our daughter Lucy all the time, but it's just such a pure example uh, of, of the, the exchange of identity. And a, a couple weeks ago, um, her and Harper were fighting over some toys and she, she like won and she like got the toys and she, she figured out it was a couple, it was like some sticker books, these little sticker books. Um, and she did it. She got them. And I told her like, hey, Lucy, you can have these toys. Like, this is for you. We got these for you. But she was afraid. Like, no, no, someone's going to take this stuff from me. And we went to put her down for a nap. Uh, we, we get her to take her socks off. She had put these sticker books in underneath her feet and put her socks on. She was hiding the sticker books in her socks. And so we take off her sock and it's her sticker book. And she kind of laughs. She's like, I didn't want anyone to take my sticker books. <laughs> like, they're yours. You're, they're yours. And she asked if she could sleep with him like next to her. Like she had this little chair by her bed and she wanted those stickers right there. And as we, as we went for her nap, she like went to bed with her face as close to the edge of the bed as possible, like staring at these books. And there's a sense by which she's, she's still learning her identity. On one hand, they're just little sisters that fight, and that happens. On the other hand, she's, she's still learning that this is safe and those are yours. This is safe and those are yours. No one's going to pull off your socks and take away your book. It's your book. There's, there's adoption stories of little kids who will go to bed holding food. Like at, at breakfast, they'll grab a bunch of Cheerios and like, stuff them in their pockets and, and it's because they're not sure they're going to have food and so they're learning what's theirs. They're learning the environment. That, there's a picture of that adoption in the Christian life where there are some things in our past that are clinging to us and there's some things we're clinging to. And here comes God the Father saying, hey, those are yours. Like you don't have to, you don't have to fight over that anymore. You're free from that. That stuff belongs to you. And so we've got to walk in this understanding that we have a new name and we have a new future and no one's going to steal your sticker books anymore. You have a new name. You have a new future. You're not going to go hungry anymore. And so when you look at your life of sin, you've got to recognize, I have a new name. I have a new future. And I'm going to cling to that truth with all I am. And I used to be dead and couldn't fight my sin. But I've been raised to life in Christ to where now I can fight back. So enemy, you no longer have mastery over me. I'm going to fight back and I'm going to walk in freedom. And you go, why, why should we walk in freedom? This is what's fascinating about the word freedom in the Bible. In Galatians chapter five, uh, the Bible says, it is for freedom that you've been set free. And you're like, that sounds redundant, Bible. Like that doesn't make sense. It is for freedom that we've been set free. What does that mean? And then you sit in that and you think about that. And there's another passage that says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. So you hear this, this theme all over the Bible and you're like, why is it for freedom that I've been set free? And then what happens in your Christian life is you actually get freedom in something. 
Like something starts, to, you, you walk in freedom, you're still struggling, but you're free. And then you realize, oh, that's what the Bible means. It's amazing to be free. Like there's a reason I've been set free. It's so that I can live free. And the joy of that, the humility of that, the, the grace in that is the life you and I were intended to live. You and I were not intended to live a beat up, beat down, defeated, shame-filled Christian life. We were intended to mortify some of our sins. I want to die to that stuff and flourish in some other areas because when you walk in freedom, you recognize your prayer life is more vibrant. Your relationships are more joyful. Your, your prayer time, your, your Bible reading is more full. Like freedom offers you a kind of life that Jesus had. And that's what we want to see in our church. When I'm not living free, I don't want to share the gospel with my neighbor. If I'm walking in freedom and praying, look out neighbor who's walking by. I'm going to be like lingering in my front yard to talk to you. If I'm not walking in freedom, I'm not operating towards my wife in kindness. If I'm walking in freedom and joy and fighting my sin, I'm going to wake up and have a lot different position towards my family. You are set free to be free because freedom is beautiful and it's a gift and many of us aren't walking in it. So today, what... What's the thing that you're struggling with that you need to fight back against? Where are you struggling that you need to get curious and investigate? You need to bring that stuff to the table and invite your friends over and go, help me figure this out. What is the fountainhead of this struggle? I am being, thoughts are being solicited to my mind. Then my affection is stirred and here's where I go. Get your friends around and get curious about your sin because a lifeless state is a state that you, where you're just beat up by sin. We don't want that for you.